Hello, so I'll be doing the last part of our presentation this afternoon. And as Eileen said, I'll be talking about um, medical implications of um, DNA sequencing or being able to use DNA sequencing. Um, the first thing I'll be talking about, well, the major topic is how to use sequencing to fight pathogens. And so first, you know, what are pathogens? Those are the organisms that make us sick. They can be bacteria like staph infections or strep infections or viruses like things as simple as the common cold to things that you really don't want to get like Ebola. Um, and then you are also protozoa and fungi are also different kinds of pathogens. If you're immune suppressed, then the candida yeast may start to infect your body and that's a position that you really don't want to be in. So these are just different articles about um, different kinds of pathogens and why they're in the news lately and causing um, problems for public health. So I'll talk about these three topics that are listed here. So first I'll, I want to describe, um, at NCBI where I work, we have this um, pathogen detection pipeline and it's uh, in collaboration with these organizations listed here. These are generally regulatory agencies that are or regulatory or scientific agencies that are involved in public health in both the United States and also, um, I think we have one in Canada, but definitely Australia and the UK also, as well as a, a hospital up in Boston. And so the way the system works is that these organizations are all interested in, um, well, all, all except for the clinical guys, these are interested in foodborne pathogens. So things that get into the food supply and we eat them and then they make us sick and, you know, it, right, initially it can take weeks or at least weeks and maybe months to figure out where the source of that contamination is and to be able to pull it out of the food supply and prevent more people from getting sick. But with this DNA sequencing based uh, method, you can go within a few days of, of taking your samples to to deciding, to being able to figure out where the source of the contamination is. And the way that it works is these agencies um, collect the DNA samples, they do the sequencing, and they submit them into the NCBI system listed here. And we process that and run, and so the process involves these boxes over here to the right. I'm just gonna come around the screen because I can't see the boxes. So um, we take the sequences and we um, assemble them into genomes and then we compare them to what we already have in the database so we can identify them. So say this is a salmonella, this is an E. coli. And then we can also compare their sequences to, to see how closely related they are to each other. And the, the concept is if they're extremely closely related to each other, then they probably came from the same source. So we, that's these last steps here, clustering them and analyze, analyzing them. We generate the reports and feed those back to the, to the group that um, gave the sample. And then we also do make the reports public. So here's an example from, I can't remember, a few years ago, where the, um, our collaborator was the Minnesota Department of Health. And they um, submitted the samples that went through the pipeline. And the result was that these 15 or so um, different strains from different people were extremely closely related. So the, the guys in red, this is looking at a, a tree of, of uh, relationships, and these red guys are very, very close to each other and farther away from everybody else in this tree. And so with that information, the Department of Health was able to go back to the individuals from whom these samples were obtained and interview them in more depth to figure out what it was that they had in common find that food source and pull it out of the food supply to prevent more people from getting sick. On a different topic, another project that um, the INSDC is involved in is um, making a database or making multiple databases to keep track of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So in my lifetime and well, since my grandmother's lifetime, you know, things have really turned around in terms of our individual public health and longevity. And a lot of that is due to the um, discovery and use of antibiotics. So we're no longer really concerned that we're going to die if we get a, a tooth abscess or if we get cut and get an infection. You know, we just take some ampicillin or something and, and we're fine. Um, however, the tide is beginning to turn a bit on that because these bacteria are now becoming resistant to these common antibiotics 
And once, if they're all resistant to all the antibiotics, then we're sort of back to the way we were for my great grandparents, you know, at the turn of the last century when having an a infected tooth could be a real problem and you may die as a result. So in, in the NCBI case, this is a White House initiative to make a, or gather a um, database, create a database of the antibiotic resistant strains. So what I'm just showing here is um, one example of a, of a profile of these different strains of Escherichia E. coli. So E. coli is a commonly found organism in our gut, generally doesn't do us any problem, have any trouble for us, but on occasion, it's, it's very bad. So these are two, three, four, five, six isolates of E. coli that have resistance to this antibiotic. And so right now, this ant that antibiotic, col colistin, is um, it, it's pretty much one of the last ditch ones that we use. Um, we try to use the common antibiotics and hope that that wipes out the bacteria, but you know you march your way along to the stronger and stronger and newer and newer ones, and this one is the last or one of the last ones available. So here's six different isolates of E. coli that were collected at different times. The two that I've listed in blue were collected on the same day in the same place. Not sure if it was from the same chicken or not, but one you know from different tissues of chicken. And if we look down here in this table, what we're looking at is these different colors are classes of antibiotics. The red is the colistin. And these two isolates that came from chicken are identical in their resistance pattern. So if the cell is green, that means it's resistant to that particular antibiotic. So EC5 and EC7 are identical, except EC7 is um, resistant to two different beta-lactamases, to both of these classes of beta-lactamase. So the INSDC is, this is an, another way that the INSDC is involved in public health and being able to have this, um, or, or multiple copies of this database of antibiotic resistance genes so that we can track the movement of the resistance across the globe and we can also keep track of how bad the problem is and what, what we're up against. My final um, example is to see how DNA sequencing can help with disease diagnosis. This is an example from three years ago where this young man, this boy, went. he was 14 and he was sick in the hospital. He was in a coma. He'd been in a coma for weeks. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with him. And so they took a chance and, and um, got a sample of his cerebral spinal fluid and sequenced that. When they sequenced it, they f and then they took the sequences and they um, did identity checks against the sequences in GenBank, uh, the INSDC um, data, nucleotide database. And when they did that, they found millions and millions of human sequences because, of course, the boy is human. But they also found a few hundred reads f that were um, identical to leptospira bacterial sequences. And so the doctors um, treated the boy for leptospirosis, so they treated to kill those bacteria, and in fact that he was cured within a few days. So this is one of the very first examples where sequencing the material from the person can identify what's causing the, can, can identify the pathogen and enable the doctors to treat and cure the child. So this just goes back to Eileen's slide with the, the the um, information that you, you never know what somebody's going to do with your data, but the fact that we have it there for everyone to use is, is what's critical. And then finally, Guy's slide that DNA sequence is, sequencing is so critical to so many different things that we're doing and is such a basic uh, um, assay that people are doing now that um, we expect the next 30 years, the exp DNA explosion, the DNA sequencing explosion to continue without pause. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions for any of us, please let us know.